Tech. I told um, uh, Mike Marshall that uh, the title, if we wanted to uh, entitle the lesson, would be taken from uh, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9 about the, the chosen generation. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. But to kind of sum up where we were, uh, to get to thought, uh, it really starts in verse uh, 7 where we left off where we're talking about uh, talking about uh, Christ and talking about the fact that he was chosen of God. He was the elect and, and so forth. But that, but that there are two, two results based on Christ coming into the world. One was that he came to save the world, but then the vast majority of the world were not going to listen to him. So th this is kind of where we were. In other words, for us, he says that he is precious. In other words, he, he is the only hope uh, that mankind has. If you look at verse 7, Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, but to them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. As a matter of fact, back in verse 6, he says that it's contained in the Scripture, and this goes back in two or three places in the Old Testament, that I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. So use that word precious a, a couple of times there. Whoever believes on him will not be confounded, will not be ashamed. So, so you have the, the, two, the, the, the two possibilities uh, about Jesus Christ. Of course, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But in reality, the vast majority of the world uh, rejects him, rejects him as the Savior. He becomes that stumbling stone. He becomes the rock of offense. Most of the world either don't know about him, uh, does, doesn't know about him, or uh, they refuse to accept him as the Christ, the anointed one, the chosen one of God, the one who came to save the world, the, the one through which, the, the only one through which uh, the, that name uh, this given that, that the only one that can possibly save Acts four and verse eleven and other places. So uh, in verse, uh, so in verse eight is kind of where we left off. So let's read that: a stone of stumbling. In other words, this uh, he's the head of the corner, the chief cornerstone. So we're going to talk about that for just a minute. A uh, stone of stumbling and rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient whereinto also they were appointed. Now, we're going to talk about that, uh, that, that term appointed here in just a minute because there's a lot of confusion uh, about that, and it leads into uh, a misunderstanding to the point that, uh, like Calvin, about predestination and so forth, that, uh, that some are appointed or destined to be saved no matter what. Some are destined to be lost no matter what. So we're going to talk about that in just a minute. But the stone of stumbling... Uh, the, the stone over which they stumble. Uh, Clark, mentions, Clark mentions this, uh, uh, not Clark, uh, Barnes, Albert Barnes. The idea seems to be that of a cornerstone which projects from the building against which they dash themselves and by which they are made to fall. The rejection of the Savior becomes the means of their ruin. They refuse to build on him, and it is as if one should run against a, a solid projecting cornerstone of a house that would certainly be the means of their destruction. Whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, uh, Matthew 21, 44. Almost the same thing is said in Luke uh, 2, verse 34. So the, the meaning is that if this foundation stone is not the means of their salvation, it will be the means of their ruin. So you got, you, you, you got either the, the they're, going to, they're, they're going to accept him, believe in him, he's precious, elect, or he becomes the means of their, uh, their, their stumbling, the means of their uh, destruction, uh, as it were, a rock of offense. He's going to talk about that in just a second. Look in um, 1 Corinthians. Let me, get, uh, let me get somebody to read that for me. Uh, Keith, if you would, read, uh, and I'll give you time to turn to it, but 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 21 through 24. This kind of sums up, I think, what Peter's talking about. Paul had a, uh, had a very um, 
similar expression, the, this word uh, stumbling stone, uh, the, the foolishness that some would uh, would consider him uh, to be or how, how foolish the preaching the gospel about a, a, a crucified Savior is and so forth. The first Corinthians 1, 21 through 24, if you would. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. For we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But in them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Okay, so you got the again the two the the, the two pictures uh, that Paul describes the the same kind as what Peter is is describing there that uh, to the Jews a stumbling block the Greeks foolishness but unto us that believe the power of God in other words and he goes on uh, to talk about many are called uh, few are chosen and so forth and so on uh, he's chosen weak things the world confound the wise and, and and so forth so so that that's kind of the picture of the Christ. Uh, coming on the scene, and uh, as and, and then continue the thought there in First Peter uh, uh, two, he talks about the stone of stumbling and rock of offense, which is pretty much the same thing. Where uh, uh, Barnes describes it kind of as a uh, as some type of stick in which there's a spring where the animal hits that and it becomes the trap. Uh, so he's he's kind of become uh, the the rock of offense, stone of stumbling. They're, they're ensnared uh, by him because they don't believe in him. And he 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 makes this statement. It then denotes that which is the cause or occasion of ruin. This language would be strictly applicable applicable to the Jews. In other words, he's mainly talking about the Jews who rejected him. That he he to them is a stone of stumbling and rock of offense. That they, they, they rejected him. And so this was the reason for uh, the destruction of their temple, the destruction of their city, and the destruction of their nation because they, they, rejected, uh, they rejected the Christ. But he says it's also applicable to all. It'd be applicable to you and me today as well because there's so many other verses that would point that out, even though he's uh, pointing out primarily uh, those that, uh, that stumble at him uh, at, at that particular point in time, but for you and me, what about what about today? The 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 world itself. If what he said is true in John fourteen uh, one through six, that he's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. That's applicable to all. There's so many other passages that would point out the same thing. So, so for those people, uh, so for us, he's the means of our salvation. To those who stumble at him and to stumble at his word, he's the means of their destruction. And uh, I'm going to have some uh, pretty interesting points that Barnes makes here in just a minute, which I thought uh, it was real interesting that Barnes makes about the fact that God knew this all along. We're going to talk about that uh, a little bit in just a second. So he says he becomes a stone of stone and rock of offense to them which stumble at the word. So the word, of course, uh, being the gospel that uh, so so the Jews re uh, rejected him and the same thing is true today for those who reject the gospel uh, what did Paul say in Romans 1 16 about the gospel it's God's power to save right God's power to save so if somebody rejects the gospel the means of their salvation it's the same as the Jews in that day uh, rejecting Jesus Christ. The two or three verses that, that I wanted to read, I have you guys turn here in just a second. Uh, uh, Henry, if you would, uh, turn to 2 Peter 3.16. Uh, Dal, turn to 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12. Tommy, turn to um, Proverbs 30 and verse 6. Donald, turn to Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2, and also Deuteronomy 12 and verse 32. And Bill, turn to Galatians 1, 6 through 9, if you would. So we're talking about, we're, we're talking about those who stumble at the Word. And we talked about this a little bit a while back, about um, how people wrestle with the gospel to their own destruction, 
they try to, and I, I, and I meant to bring uh, the Nelson's commentary because I wanted to, uh, wanted to show you, I did this one time before, maybe two or three years ago, to show you how the, the commentators in uh, Nelson's commentary reason out baptism for the remission of sins. I wanted to, I wanted you to, to see that again. I forgot it, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to do that. Now, we're just, th this is what we're talking about, about stumbling at the word. And I know uh, Lloyd and I've talked several times about sometimes you wish God had made things a little plainer, but there's so many examples of how plain it is. And yet, what does he say? They still stumble at the word, even though they have no reason or no excuse to stumble at the word. All right, look at, um, uh, look at the verse that I mentioned, uh, Henry, if you would, 2 Peter 3.16. 3, as, <clears throat> as also in all his uh, epistles, speaking to them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which they are, are unlearned and un unstable with rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. All right. So that word rest uh, has that idea of wrestle with. In other words, they uh, uses a, a shorter version of it. But uh, to wrestle with the word, for some reason, trying to reason it out. And he says, to their own destruction. So there's, uh, there's a sense in which it's their own fault, uh, basically is what he's saying. It's not God's fault. He didn't write it uh, in a way that would be uh, confusing, but uh, but some people has made it that way. All right, anybody? All right, second. Uh, thank you, Don. Second, Th second Thessalonians two nine through twelve. Who had that one? Even yeah. him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all the deceitfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be condemned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. Right. Pitiful state to be in, isn't it? In other words, that they, they wouldn't receive the love of the truth, so God will allow them to be deluded and then down their souls because of it. That basically is what it's saying there. Proverbs 30, verse 6, Tom. Huh? And uh, not unto his word this. He recruit, recruit thee, and thou be found a liar. Okay, is that the one? Yeah, that's the one you gave it. Is that the one? Proverbs 30 and 6. Read that one more time. Add thou not unto his words. Yeah, there you go. I got it. I was daydreaming there for a second. And thou be found a liar. Yeah, add not. Add not. Add not. Add not to his word. So, so, but that's what some people do. They either add to the word or they take something from it. They twist it, turn it, wrestle with it, and uh, uh, which is bad on all counts. All right. I don't believe that's what it means. Yeah, there you go. It, it, I know what it says, but that's not what it means. Here, kind of. We've heard that before. Here. All right, look at uh, Deuteronomy 4, 2, Donald, and also a very similar expression in Deuteronomy 12, 32. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now read in that order? Yeah, either way. Yeah, doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, when things, what things soever I command you observe to do it, thou shalt not add there to, nor diminish from it. All right. So now you just added a statement. Don't don't add to it. Don't take from it. And he says pretty much the same thing in Deuteronomy 4 and verse 2. Go ahead with that one. One, two. Four, two, yeah. You should not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish all from it, okay. that you may keep the commandments all right. of the Lord. All right. Both, both verses are very, very uh, similar. And in Bill Galatians uh, 1, Paul was astonished at what was going on uh, when he wrote to the churches of Galatians, Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ 
to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. And pretty plain in the Lord. Yep. <laughs> how, how can you misunderstand that? But that's what happens. All these verses kind of point out uh, what we're trying to 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 illustrate the people that stumble at the word for what, whatever reason, either they add to it, they take from it, they wrestle with it to their own destruction. Uh, they don't believe it. They, they, they twist it around, turn it around and so forth. And then the next statement that he makes is being disobedient. In other words, those that stumble at the word, being disobedient. And of course, uh, we're commanded to believe the gospel and a refusal to do it, uh, of course, is going to be uh in our uh, Bailey week, uh, when we stand before God in the day of judgment, and what he says about disobedience, we won't turn to him and read it, but just for your reference, Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14, basically what does he say there? Fear God and keep his commandments. Yep, this is the whole of man and the whole duty of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. Go ahead, Lord. Verse in Romans 3, 3, I always like that. For, for what if some did not believe you, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? Yeah. So, you know, you may not believe, but it doesn't change what God said. It Absolutely. Change the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I guess you probably know that we used to have a guy who attended church here and was in our class that wrestled a lot with the truth and trying to get the scriptures to coincide with each other. He couldn't yeah. quite do it. Yeah. He no longer goes to church. I think. Yeah. Exactly I right. Know I'm talking about. Yeah, I know, I know who you're talking about. Absolutely. It's sad. It's very sad. And then a couple of verses in uh, the New Testament kind of point out the same thing is Matthew 7, 21. Uh, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. He that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And then one more uh, Joel uses quite a bit is Hebrews 5, 8, and 9, that he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey, obey him. So again, talking about his commandments that, uh, that Solomon talked about in Ecclesiastes 12, that Jesus talked about in Matthew 7. And all of the other uh, passages that would kind of illustrate uh, the same thing. Go ahead, Scott. Revelation chapter 22, verse 19. And if any man shall take away from these words of the book yep. of, my, of this prophecy, God shall also take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Yep. So you got it from. Cover to cover, as they say, from Deuteronomy, you know, in the uh, in the time of Moses, from Deuteronomy 4, all the way through Re Revelation 22. And uh, that's a period of, what, 3,500 years, thereabouts. So you've got that theme uh, throughout about not changing God's word. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit when we get to um, the people in Jeremiah's day, particularly pouring out drink offers to the queen of heaven and so forth and so on and, and, and what he told them to do. And they said, we will not do it. Yeah, hearken to me. We will not hearken. We will not let, we're going to do what goes, what comes out of our own mind and out of our own thoughts. A very dangerous uh, position to be in. So, um, so you become the stone of stumbling, rock of offense, those that stumble at the word being disobedient. And he says, whereunto they were appointed. Now, we talked about that a little bit. I wanted to get into that for just a second. Uh, appointed unto what? Uh, so, uh, Barnes makes a couple of good points about this. Let me just read a little bit about it and invite your comments. And I don't want to go into a lot of detail in it because Keith's already done that uh, when we talked about, uh, when, when he's talking about predestination uh, back in the, uh, some of his lessons on Calvin and, and uh, so forth and so on. So I won't belabor the point, but just two or three things that Barnes makes that I thought was uh, pretty good. It says, this would involve all the difficulty which is ever felt in the doctrine uh, of degrees or election. For it would mean then that he had eternally designated them to be saved, which is the doctrine of predestination and if this were the true interpretation, the consequence would follow that God had been foiled in his plan. For well, the reference here is to those who would not be saved, that is, to those who stumble at the stumbling stone and are destroyed. Well, Calvin uh, supposed that it meant uh, predestination in the sense that 
Some are chosen. You can't do anything about it. Salvation. If you're, if you're going to be saved, you're going to be saved. And if you're going to be lost, you're going to be lost. So, uh, but there are several others, and I won't read all of these, but I want to read a couple of them. And I don't, I don't know what these guys are. I'm just uh, either commentators or Bible scholars. Uh, some of you guys might, might know uh, from your study. But Bloomfield says this about this statement. Unto which they were destined, meaning, as he supposes, that into this stumbling and disobedience, they were permitted by God to fall, which makes more sense. In other words, uh, God didn't cause it. He didn't predestine them, but he, he predestined what was going to happen to them if they rejected the Savior, if they rejected his word. And that's what, I think that's what uh, Bloomfield is saying here. Uh, another one uh, makes this statement. Uh, let me find it. To which also they were appointed by the righteous sentence of God long before, even as early as in the first purpose and decree, he ordained his son to be the great foundation of his church. Another one says this. They were appointed not that they should sin, but that sinning they should be punished. Another one. Let me read uh, just one or two more real quick that because they were disobedient, as he supposes, to the Jews who rejected the Messiah, they were appointed for the punishment of that disobedience to fall and perish. And then Dr. Clark supposes that it means that they were prophesied of that they should thus fall, or that long before it was predicted that they should thus stumble and fall. In reference to the meaning of this difficult passage, it is proper to observe that there is in the Greek verb necessarily the idea of designation, appointment, or purpose. Uh, meaning to say it, to put, to lay, to lay down, and so forth and so on, by which this result was brought about. The fair sense, therefore, and one from which we cannot escape, is that this did not happen by chance or accident, but that there was a divine arrangement, appointment, or plan on the part of God in reference to this result, and that the result was in, com in conformity with that. And just mentioned two or three things in that, con that connection. Uh, the facts are that God appointed his son to be the cornerstone of his church. This was done before the world was. In other words, he determined before the world was that he was going to send his son into the world uh, to save us. The second thing, that there was a portion of the world which, from some cause, would embrace him and be saved. And there was another portion who, it was certain, would not embrace him. Now, if we go back to Acts 28 and 24, we've mentioned this one before. What happened when Paul preached to them from morning till evening? Some believed the things that he said, some believed not. And going back, and we won't turn and read it, but uh, for your reference, those of you that uh, take notes, I know Keith is writing down some notes there, or writing down the verses. But Jeremiah 6, 15 to 17, makes a, a, a point about that, that uh, they were told to hearken, to, to, to listen, and so forth. We will not. We will not do that. So it wasn't that God predetermined that they would do that, but he knew that was going to be the case. I want to read a statement here in just a minute that I, that I found very interesting. And then the case of the Queen of Heaven uh, from Jeremiah 44, 15 through 22, where he said, well, since we left off burning incense to the Queen of Heaven, all these bad things have happened to us. But if we burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, we're going to, everything's going to be right with us. You see, and Jeremiah warned them over and over and over uh, throughout that book. So, and what Barnes says is this, that it was known that the appointment of the Lord Jesus as a Savior would be the occasion of their rejecting Him. In other words, God knew this, uh, God knew this in eternity, and of their deeper and more aggravated condemnation, that the arrangement was nevertheless made. And this was kind of uh, impressive to me, the way he phrased it, a lot better than I could. So let me just read this short paragraph to you. In other words, said, even though God knew what was going to happen, he foreordained, and, and uh, Acts 2 and other places point out that same thing, God knew he foreordained his son to come to, to save the world, that the arrangement to send his son was nevertheless made with the understanding that all this would be so, and because it was best on the whole that it should be so, even though this consequence would follow. In other words, even though God knew that the vast majority of the world was going to reject him, 
He sent it for you and me, even if there had been one person or two or this uh, 10 in this classroom. That is, it was better, this is Barnes saying, that it, it was better that the arrangements should be made for the salvation of people, even with this result, that a part would sink into deeper condemnation than that no arrangement should be made to save any. So that was kind of an interesting uh, take on it from my standpoint. In other words, what he's saying is that, that God foreknew. So did he know that Adam and Eve was going to sin? Well, what, what would have been the reason? In other words, it wasn't an afterthought of God if we say that it wasn't an afterthought of God to send his son after the events of uh, Genesis 2 and, and, and so forth then he must have known, yeah. right? Amen. So if he so if he knew, what he's saying is, even though God could foresee, in other words, he sees the end from the beginning. So if he sees the end from the beginning, if he foreknew that the vast majority of the world was going to reject him, what he's saying is, he was going to send him anyway to save some. What did, what did Paul say? I became all things to all men so that by all means I might save some. Okay, and what he's, what he's saying here is that God foreknew that. God foreknew that. Go ahead, Israel. I think it goes back to that point you made before, Brother Lester, about God so loved. The world. Yep, that word adverb, so. So loved is such important. I mean, really, when you really think about what God did, because we, we've all heard that what God said to son. We, you know, that's true, but what does that mean? Yeah. That means God laid everything on the line. Yep. including being tempted from sin, yes, leaving heaven, yes, but being tempted of sin, what if he would have sinned? Because if he would have sinned, what would have been the consequences? Yeah. And so what would have been the consequences upon the Father and the Spirit if Christ would have sinned? So God yeah. laid all of that on the line. And so, yeah, he, pre he knew, yeah. but he so loved the church, those that are saved, in the world, and just this is who he is. Yeah. That it, you know, it's just it's amazing. Uh, absolutely, it's kind of like, uh, and Keith made a uh, statement about this a few weeks ago about about the appointment. In other words, the appointment is, in other words, this is the result if this is what you do. In other words, he didn't he didn't uh, predetermine for us to sin. He didn't predetermine for us to be lost. Uh, but he didn't say, well, Lord is saved and Scott stopped. He didn't do that. So, so the, the idea uh, is that he knew what the result was going to be, but you and I have a choice in, you know, what we do about it, even though God foreknew the foreknowledge of God, uh, and, and the Bible talks about the foreknowledge of God, and that, that, that he foreknew in several different places, and uh, Ephesians 1 is, a, is an example, yes. Acts 2, and yes. different places. I mean, but it's, it's, it's philosophically speaking, and I'm not talking, I'm just talking about the way things work. That's yeah. what the Bible tells us. God tells yeah. us how things work. Yep. You're going to have the same result. You plug into an equation, maybe different circumstances, but in God's law, it's always going to be the same result. Yeah. yeah. No matter what it is, absolutely. And so, being who he is, it wasn't that he wanted anybody to be lost. That's contrary. Yep. But since things work the way that they do, then if someone goes against his will, that's the result. But it's always the same idea of the choice always being ours. Yeah, as a matter of fact, the Bible says he, he's not willing that it should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And, and several other pastors kind of point out the same thing about the, uh, the fact that he came to, to save everyone, that everyone has an opportunity. That, that was that's what God wanted. But It all boils down to the fact that from the very beginning, God determined that whoever believers would be saved and yep. disbelievers would be lost. Absolutely. That, that, that was the... To just that. Yeah, that was the... That was the, yeah, the, the predetermination, mm -hmm. as we might say, the predestination. I don't see how you read the book and then determine all. Some people are deter predetermined to go to hell and some people are predetermined to save. Absolutely. If it's that the case, 
what was the purpose to any of it? Yeah. What was the purpose for all the sacrifices in the Old Testament? Yeah, Other right. animals had to die. Why did God hurt himself sending his son, watching his son die? Yeah. He didn't have to do that. He's already predetermined some are saved, some are lost. He didn't have to do anything. Exactly. So, we have exactly. To live how we want to. Exactly. Where we're going to yeah, if the son has nothing to do with it anyway, you know. And then some will take the theory of, oh, well, God sent his son, so he saved us with mercy. Mercy for everybody. You don't have to do anything. Well, yeah. And then others take the theory of, well, how, how would a merciful God send people to hell? Well, if you think about it, he's a lot more merciful in the New Testament than he ever was in the Old Testament. Because Ananias and Sapphira got killed immediately. Lot's wife, Lot's wife was struck down immediately for disobeying. Yep. But in today's time, we can disobey God our entire life. And as long as we turn and live correctly before we die, he's merciful to forgive everything. Yeah. So those didn't have a chance to repent, did they? I mean, yeah. those, those didn't have a chance. Yeah, absolutely. All the people in the flood had 120 years, but as soon as it started yeah. raining, they didn't have a chance. Absolutely. Dale made a, made a point there that it, it kind of reminded me of a statement that Keith was making the other day, or Sunday, I think, <clears throat> about works and, and how that uh, some people say, you well, you can't do anything because this is work, this is work, this is work. But they'll say, they'll say, well, but you got to believe in him. But I did. It, I couldn't find that passage the other day, Keith, when you were making that statement, but I found it when I got back home. John six twenty nine. Yeah, I should have known you would have known it. Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that you believe on him who hath sent. So if you talk about, well, you can't do anything. Well, he says that belief is a work. So if you're going to work, well, did you earn that? No, didn't earn that. But anyway, I was going to bring that up, but well, you, 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 were, say, you were a step ahead of me, Jesus. Well, you can't get anywhere if you don't either, one, walk yourself there, drive yourself there, or yeah. somehow work your way to get there. Yeah. You're, you're not going anywhere. So if they say yeah. you can't do any work, so I guess you'll just yeah. sit at the house. And... Yeah, well, they say, well, it's a gift, you know, and nothing, yeah. nothing, it's a gift, you know. Go ahead, Keith, you had a thought. Well, I was just going to... And then Scott, you, you got a thought. Uh, Brother Israel said, by God so loved the world, that is an awesome thought, and it really is when you... Think about the verses you talked about when it talks about before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world, he knew we were sinned. In spite of that, he created us. But he knew that Jesus was going to have to die for his creation before he ever made us. Yep. And he made us anyway. That's, that's yep. a mind blow. It I is. Mean, who would do that? I knew that. I said, I'm not going to create those people. Well, yeah. he, he, still made he, us. he did that knowing. Yeah, still yeah. made us in his image. Yeah. And, and knowing what they're going to do to his son. Yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. Not, that's an awesome. I mean, it goes back to like Ephesians 3, 19 and 20. It says you can't comprehend, you know, yeah. the love of God. It's yeah. incredible. Thing. We're yeah. just thankful for Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. Yeah. God doesn't think right. like we do. Yeah, exactly. If our, if our dog yeah. bites us, we want to kill it. <laughs> God, God doesn't feel that way. Yeah. And I, I like when we're talking about God so loved the world. And I don't I don't know if Second Corinthians 9, 15 is talking about the Christ or not in the context. But whether it is or not, the, the thought is the same. It, it, he is an unspeakable gift. I mean, how do you put a how do you put a, a, a price tag on that? I, I had to even comprehend it as Keith was talking about the gift of the the, the Son of God, and the, the expression is used. And thanks be to God for His unspeakable gift in the Second Corinthians nine uh, fifteen. I believe it is. Go ahead, Scott. What, what always comes to me when we talk about the uh, uh, predestination. Is I sure would like folks to get to know me before they want to condemn me to hell. Yeah. So, I mean, that's not the way God does it. Absolutely. And, and just to think that way is is beyond me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Go ahead. Here is the <coughs> foreknowledge of God compared to death, predestination. Yep. I think it's probably the writer that wrote the, used that word predestination probably was a thought they might have changed that to some other word when they were writing that because that's that's the confusion i i've had i've taught that several times in class people they use that word predestination yeah. and it's not it's a foreknowledge of god yeah that's what's out there god yeah. knows what's going to happen and what we're all the way to the end he says yeah early. absolutely but absolutely you're, you're, you're confusing it with predestination and yeah. that's not predestination absolutely it's, absolutely you know it Absolutely. Good point. Let me just read just two couple of statements uh, real quick and, and invite your thoughts again. To kind of sum up what he's saying here. Uh, he says, um, what we're talking about, it was what was foreseen 
what was involved in the purpose to save any. It was not a matter that was not not it was not a matter that was unforeseen that the consequence of giving a savior would result in the condemnation of those who should who should crucify and reject him. But the whole thing, as it actually occurred, entered into the divine arrangement, like we we're talking about. It may be added that as in the facts of the case, nothing wrong has been done by God, and no one has been deprived of any rights or punished more than he deserves. It was not wrong in him to make the arrangement. It was better that the arrangement should be made as it is, even with this consequence, in other words, the fact that they're going to reject him anyway, than that none at all should be made for human salvation. And I think he makes a real, real good point about that, because in the reality, the vast majority of the people, like, like Jesus himself said, many are called, how many are chosen? Few are chosen. How many the, the fewest? In other words, he talks about this statement, that all things enter into the... Uh, eternal plans of God, that nothing happens by chance, that there is nothing that was not foreseen, and that the plan is such as, on the whole, God saw to be best and wise and therefore adopted it. If there is nothing unjust or wrong in the actual development of the plan, there was nothing informing it. At the same time, no man who disbelieves and rejects the gospel should take refuge in this as an excuse. He was appointed to it no otherwise than as, as it actually occurs. And as they know that they are voluntary in rejecting him, they cannot lay the blame of this on the purposes of God. They are not forced or compelled to do it, but it was seen that the consequence would follow and the plan was laid to send the Savior notwithstanding. And I think he makes a pretty good uh, thought about that. Go ahead, Scott. It's not like God told us without taking us to the to the, I mean, he, he practically puts us right there in points. That's the narrow way. That's the rough way. Yeah. Or, or, or that's the easy way. And it's up to us to take the right road. And it's it's not. If we read our Bibles, it's not confusing. Yeah. And you do what is right in the eyes of God, you will be on the right yeah. road. Yeah. So um, then the. Like I said, the predestination is just, uh, to me, it's, I, 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 don't, I don't understand it. I don't know how you can believe, I don't, how you, yeah, it yeah, I don't know how you can believe in a theory like that. I know Keith ex expressed it very well in the class when we talked about that. Yeah, yeah. But how you, if, if God is a just God and if there's no respect of persons, how in the world can, can you justify those verses that pertain to uh, God and his justice, his mercy, his love, and, and all of that, and say, well, he appointed this one, regardless of what he does, to heaven, appointed this one, no matter what he does or doesn't do, to hell. It's hard for me to believe in a God like that. Well, I, I don't believe in a God like that. Go ahead, Ezra. Well, as Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the first century, there were the knowing ones, the yeah. Gnostics. They had this special inner light that yeah. God talked to them. And Brother Joel has made a great point, Brother, maybe Brother Keith did about that too, about those who believe in Calvinism were extreme elitist and still are today, from what I understand. You know, they are the ones that are chosen that they are better, and they basically look down upon everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so that same kind of mindset is what you would see with someone who would say God is a respecter. Yeah. Going off of what Dow said, isn't it funny that the Bible says the grace of God appeared unto all men? In Titus 2, yeah. uh, 2 with 11 and 12. For him to sit there, they would have the Holy Spirit lying yeah. in saying that, which is blasphemous. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Good point. You guys made some excellent points about that. Any further thought on that, anybody? I want to get to verse 9, because I told, uh, I told uh, Mike this is a title for a lesson, and we're just not getting to it. But anyway, so I apologize for that. But he, he talks about verse, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, you are a chosen generation. In other words, in contradistinction from those who, by their disobedience, had rejected the Savior, uh, these people are represented as the chosen of God or the elect of God. And he has different terms to describe them. He talks about a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, so many things about that. Well, one 
One verse that points that out is Revelation 1 and verse 6, has made us kings and priests unto God, and other verses that point that out. So uh, and it talks about, in addition to that, we're a holy nation. Notice the different terms that are used, chosen generation, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. So he made us, uh, as it were, a kingdom of, of a priest and a holy nation. And this, uh, th this goes all the way back. And I think he's quoting from Exodus 19 and verse 6. It goes all the way back to that because that same expression is used, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation in, in Exodus 19 and verse 6. And the word peculiar doesn't mean odd. And we've talked about that, you know. That means we're odd. That means we're odd. Odd behold, you know. Maybe yeah. To the world. Maybe to the world. Yeah. Absolutely. But here, in other words, it's a people for His possession. We're not. We're, we're uh, peculiar. That's saying we're a people uh, for His uh, possession. In other words, we belong to Him. So uh, that's that's the difference or the, uh, the peculiar nature of that. Not that uh, that we're um, some. What is the right word? Kind of oddball. Yeah, an odd, oddball, oddball kind of person. So that that's not what he's talking about there. So there are very, a lot of uh, places to point that out. Israel was uh, quoted from Titus 2, uh, 11 to 12 while ago, and you continue on in Titus 2 uh, down to verse 14. He, he said that it's a peculiar people zealous of good works. So that's another place that the word peculiar is used to describe us. Uh, uh, your yeah. Oh, no, that's it. That's it. Yeah, Titus two fourteen. Yeah, right, right, right after uh, uh, Israel was talking about the uh, statements there in, in Titus two eleven and twelve. Well, thank you guys. Appreciate it, and uh, we'll take up there. We didn't get very far verse wise, but hopefully it, it was a somewhat interesting. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Thank you very much. Same thing, brother Mike.